Hello, and welcome to another episode of Bornbrook's In Conversation With series. I'm Michael Curzon, Bornbrook's editor, but today I'll be handing the reins to Guy Denton, a regular contributor to the magazine who holds a particular interest in American politics and has interviewed for our print issues such figures as Michael Knowles and Charles Cook. Today, Guy interviews Kevin Williamson, an American conservative commentator at the National Review who is also the author of a number of books, including 2015's The Case Against Trump. In his interview, Guy talks to Mr. Williamson about Trump, his response to the coronavirus, and the upcoming American election. In his first question, Guy asks what Mr. Williamson's views are on how Donald Trump has led America during the pandemic, as well as on the federal government's response. The president spent the earliest part of the uh, epidemic basically trying to tweet life into the stock market and saying you know, it's not going to be a big deal and we shouldn't worry about this too much. And you saw the same thing in a lot of other places. You saw the same thing in China, for that matter, where political figures very quickly calculated the economic damage something like this was likely to do. And, and in wanting to avoid that fallout, they tried to minimize the problem rather than really come after it um, aggressively. So Trump has been Trump, which is to say silly and ignorant and all over every side of every possible issue and uh, inconsistent and all the rest of it. Um, I suppose the good news is that it's one more reminder that the central government isn't really as central to our lives as we sometimes think it is. I think the United States is more or less handling this reasonably well. I mean, if things could be better, things could certainly be worse. Um, but the direction isn't really that coming much from, from Washington or even from state and local governments. You know, people are making decisions about social distancing and things like that um, on their own, not necessarily just because they're being told to by someone in elected office. How do you anticipate that the current Seabury uh, to say the least, situation will affect the president's chances of re-election and the shape of the current race. I've seen some mixed polling. Uh, there was about a news article on NR the other day that said the latest Gallup poll shows his highest approval rating yet, but other yeah. recent polling certainly contradicts that. So do you think that this, especially since there doesn't seem to be a real science to how the economy tends to impact elections and influence a president's standing among the public. Do you think that Trump will be in quite a disadvantageous position? Um, well, there are going to be some real challenges on that front. I mean, I should start off with my usual observation that Americans have basically superstitious beliefs about the relationship between presidents and economies. Um, the American economy is enormous. It's very complex. There are trillions and trillions of factors that shape economic decision making and economic outcomes in a big, complex economy such as ours. Um, who happens to be sitting in the White House at any given time and even differences in policies from one president to the next are not these, you know, enormously dispositive things that they're treated as. We have this kind of very primitive priest king attitude toward that, you know, if the uh, if the rains don't come and the crops don't come in and the animals aren't fertile, it's because the king didn't propitiate the cereal gods in the right way. And that's basically how we think of the presidency, uh, which is nonsense, of course, but that doesn't mean that's not going to affect how the elections turn out. So if we look at the CBO numbers and forecasts on this, the uh, you know coming quarter will probably be the worst quarter in American economic history at least since they've been been keeping records of that sort of thing in terms of GDP contraction. So it'll be probably something more than uh, 11 percent. So the only thing really even that close to that was in the Eisenhower uh, recession in 1958, I guess it was, when there was a 10 percent decline. So they're going to hit a quarter that's going to be unlike anything that um, that really modern politics has ever seen. And anyone who tells you they know how that's going to shake out is, I think, not being entirely honest. Um, and again, if the CBO numbers are right, that'll be followed up by a pretty strong bounce in the quarter after that, um, going into October, November in the election. On the downside for Trump, though, um, unemployment's going to be 
horrible. Again, if the numbers are correct, if the forecasts are correct, it'll be something like 14% in the coming quarter, and it'll continue moving in the wrong direction in the next quarter, up to 16%. So having recently experienced the worst economic quarter in American history and having unemployment at very, very high levels is going to make things difficult for Trump. His argument, of course, will be, well, everything was going great until this unforeseeable thing happened that um, no one could reasonably plan for or expect. And um, I, you know, some people may be persuaded by that. Um, it's very difficult for me to imagine very many Donald Trump voters from 2016 changing parties and voting for Joe Biden at this point, although there may be enough in a couple of uh, states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan to... Uh, to make the difference, you know, a few hundred thousand votes could uh, could really basically change the the outcome. So it's 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 really very difficult to say. I think how that's going to work. It's going to be pretty. Um, it's going to be a roller coaster, but the GDP numbers will be a roller coaster pointed upward uh, going into the election, while the employment numbers will be a roller coaster pointed in the opposite direction from what I think the president would want. Do you think that Joe Biden has anything to really offer beyond the fact that he is a comparatively innocuous alternative to Trump? And do you think that Biden will be any more attractive to the Democrats who refused to vote for Hillary in 2016 than she ended up being? Yes, I think Biden will be more attractive to those Democrats than, than Hillary was for a lot of reasons. Um, no, I don't think Biden offers very much to to anybody, really, um, including to himself. I'm sure that he uh, really has thought through very much about his own policies. So, you know, Biden, as I often point out, I am. You know, there's a lot of gray in this beard here. And Biden was elected to the Senate the year I was born. Um, so he's been in national and in federal office for the entirety of my lifetime, um, or at least from the beginning of it. He uh, he came into the Senate the first year that black and white televisions were superseded by color televisions in New Sales in the United States. So he's a visitor from 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 another era in, in many ways. The question for Biden is more a question about Trump, I guess, which everything seems to be right now. And that is um, how much revulsion there is for him out there. You know, in 2016, he was a novelty. He was this new thing. Nobody knew how it was going to turn out. Um, people were dissatisfied with the status quo for pretty good reasons in both parties. They still are. And uh, but I think that now you've seen uh, four years of Trump. You'll have seen four years of Trump almost going to the election. And um, a lot of the things he promised, of course, did not come to pass. Um, even without the coronavirus epidemic, you know, the promised uh, GDP growth of, I think, his, what was his number, 3%, something like that. It's not come to pass. Uh, there's no wall built along the border, and Mexico wasn't forced to pay for it. There hasn't been a major reordering of American foreign policy or even trade relations. Um, you know, all the trade war with China essentially came to naught, and they were bought off for a kind of vague promise to buy some more American exports at some point in the future. China's made many promises like this in the past. It's always ignored them. It's what's going to happen this time around, too, almost certainly. So Trump has not delivered on his policy promises or even really come very close to it. Now, I think that, that would be much more significant if Trump was a policy candidate and if that was the source of his support, which it isn't. Um, Trump is a big raised middle finger to a big part of the American electorate. He's a mascot in these dopey culture wars that really dominate our politics right now. And he's not going to stop doing that. You know, the people who say, well, I like Trump on the policy, but I just I wish he wouldn't tweet and all that sort of stuff. Those people are liars. Every last one of them <laughs> is a liar. The tweets and the bumptiousness and the silliness and the conspiracy theories and the, you know, berating reporters and that kind of stuff. This is why people elected Trump. It's why people support Trump. And uh, that's the base of his support, is this emotional validation, this sort of a catharsis. It's certainly not about policy. I mean, to the extent that Trump has gotten much of anything done in office, he signed a very conventional Republican tax bill, exactly the bill that Paul Ryan would have signed if he were president, that Mitt Romney would have signed if he were president. 
And, and you know, he's putzed about on the edges of a few other things. Um, even when his party controlled both houses of Congress, as it did for the first two years of his presidency, there was no serious effort made on uh, immigration and illegal immigration, especially which was his hallmark issue. Um, again, as I repeating myself here, the trade stuff hasn't really um, been renegotiated to the extent that I think would have been consistent with his promises. So fortunately for him, though, I don't think he's going to be judged on his deliverables because his real deliverable is an emotional deliverable. Do you think that, uh, can you offer a prediction as to who Biden's pick for vice president might be? And do you think that a shrewd choice on his part may enhance his appeal to certain groups and overall electability? Maybe at the margins. Um, I don't like to make predictions because I don't have enough information about this sort of thing to make any predictions. Uh, God knows what they're thinking over at the Biden camp. Um, <laughs> you know, the fact that he put Chris Dodd in charge of this process suspects to me he's not thinking very much about it at all. Um, a really bizarrely bad decision that not only you know, Biden made, but the people around him let him make. You know, no one stopped him and said, hey, you've got this uh, sexual harassment, sexual assault problem. Maybe you shouldn't make the most prominent person on your campaign at this point someone who has some similar issues, uh, you know, of accusations of misbehavior and sexual assault. So, um, yeah, goodness knows what they're thinking over there. Um, I'd hate to even hazard a guess. Um, early in the primaries, I thought that uh, Kamala Harris would be a much stronger candidate than she turned out to be. Um, you know, both as a black woman from California, which is kind of, you know, punches a lot of, uh, checks a lot of boxes that you want to check as a Democratic candidate, but also because she's reasonably smart and ruthless and seems to be a fairly natural politician in a lot of ways, but just wasn't very good at it. And um, So she seems in many ways like someone who would be the most natural pick for him, but um, who knows what he'll think and whether that'll make much difference. Although I think historically we've seen that um, vice presidential picks don't really make that much difference. It used to be about trying to deliver a particular state in the Electoral College, but you know our states are so polarized now and there are so few states that are really in play that once you've said, well, I'm going to pick a woman, and then if you also decide you have to pick a woman from who meets some other demographic, demographic criteria and, and also needs to be from a swing state to help you electorally, you're talking about, you know, a pool of 10 or 15 people, um, if that, who might be uh, might be likely vice presidential candidates. So it's, it, it's very difficult to say what, what that's going to be, um, although I suspect that um, the election really ends up being a referendum on Trump more than it is a referendum on Biden or a Trump versus Biden question. And um, I think a lot of my Democratic friends are... Um, kidding themselves about that being a very lopsided outcome in their favor. Um, part of me wishes that, however the election turns out, that it's not close. I'd, I'd, I would almost rather see it be a landslide one way or the other than a close election uh, one way or the other. And, um, you know, a landslide, either for the Republicans or for the Democrats, might inspire some corporate uh, introspection in those parties uh, might cause them to rethink some of the daft and inexplicable things they've been doing for, for a long time now. A close election just ensures more of the, you know, what we have right now, which I think is not especially productive for us. That's quite a good conclusion, actually. So if we can shift mercifully, perhaps, shift topics to some... I hate talking about elections. Yeah. <laughs> really do. I, I don't unless I'm feeling nice. So. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I, I have always been curious, I have to say, about your background. Uh, how exactly did you come to write for National Review? And was it always your ambition to enter political commentary? Funny, I applied for a job at National Review when I was in high school. Um, I uh, was trying to decide where to go to college, and I was kind of thinking about going to Yale. And I wrote Bill Buckley a letter offering my services, you know, as a 18-year-old, 17-year-old uh, editor of the high school newspaper in Lubbock, Texas. 
Um, plus, I needed money, so I figured I was going to need a job. And I thought National Review might be a good place to work. So I've always been a National Review reader and a big National Review fan. And Bill Buckley was one of the reasons I wanted to become a writer as a kid. I spent most of my the first half of my life as a newspaper editor, uh, not doing political commentary or sometimes writing a political column. But that was kind of more in addition to my uh, managerial and administrative uh, duties. So I was in the business of uh, running small town community newspapers, mostly. Um, I did work at a big uh, newspaper company in India for a period of time when I first got out of school. And I worked for, you know, some mid-sized daily newspapers in Texas and other places. But, um, well, no, just Texas. Uh, but most of my career, I was running, you know, kind of suburban and small town uh, newspapers. I had the brilliant idea of starting a new daily newspaper in Philadelphia. Uh, I think it was in 2005 or something like that. And after that, crashed and burned and lost a tremendous time. <laughs> and... Um, and the outcome is exactly what any reasonable person would have expected it to be. Um, I found myself unemployed for a bit. And I um, eventually went to work for an organization called the Institute for Humane Studies, which is a kind of a classical liberal um, organization that helps students who are looking to enter particular kinds of careers, uh, mostly in academics. But I ran their program for people who wanted to become journalists. And I chained my way into the job at National Review. They asked me for a recommendation for an editor, and I recommended myself, and uh, that's how I got there. Your columns have always been marked by a real flair for your writing style, and especially in the manner in which you play with language. Did it take time for you to refine your skills in this regard, or has it always just been a natural talent? And have any particular influences shape your style in that sense? Yeah, I mean, I've kind of always written that way. I hope it's gotten better uh, over time, <laughs> um, which I, I suppose it has. I mean, you've probably done this too. You go back and look at something you wrote even five years ago, and I was in my 40s five years ago. Um, sometimes I go, eh, you know, I wouldn't have written that that way now. Um, so I've pretty much always written the way I write, I suppose. Um, I mean, you've got more freedom in certain contexts than you do in others. Uh, Bill Buckley was a huge influence on me. Tom Wolfe was a big uh, influence on me. I love Hunter S. Thompson. I like David Foster Wallace, uh, writers like that. Um, you know, people who do a little work to try to entertain you while you're reading. One of the things I hate about American journalism, and this is actually in, in distinction to uh, British journalism, is that um, I never know who to credit for this, this observation. It was someone who said it some time ago. I could never find it or look it up. But um, in the United States, journalism is a subset of the political world, whereas in the UK, journalism has always been sort of a subset of the literary world. So in the United States, the mark of seriousness in journalism is this very bland, insipid, featureless prose. <laughs> Washington Post, New York Times, uh, voice of God kind of writing. And the sort of writing I do strikes people who are inclined to look at that as their measure of seriousness strikes people as being, you know, unserious or affected or over the top, which, hey, maybe it is all those things. I don't know. Um, yeah. Certainly it is some of those things sometimes. And um, but I just if you're going to ask someone to sit down and read 700 words you've written, much less, you know, I write sometimes 60,000 words on something. Um, you really kind of owe it to them to try to be good company, you know, and to be to be entertaining and give them, uh, you know, a little something every uh, couple of sentences that makes the um, makes the experience more more pleasurable. So, um, if I had to write the way they write at the Washington Post or the New York Times, I would find it difficult to do. I think. I mean, I can do that kind of writing and. I write in a more generic voice when I, for instance, write National Review editorials, which aren't, you know, under my byline. They're under the National Review editor's byline. So you don't want to have one of those Kevin Williamson, you know, 237 word opening sentences with 18 adverbs in it. Um, but that's just not what I like to do. And I figure, you know, you only get to uh, do one thing. So I'm going to try to enjoy it. I ask this out of curiosity. I'm not surprised to hear you mention Tom Wolfe. I love Tom Wolfe. And I remember reading once about the um, uh, his PhD, his dissertation that he wrote. I've never read it. 
But I remember reading in an article, a critic who had read it said that it represented everything wrong with academia because of the way it was written was so agonizingly dry and in yeah. no way resembled any of his, never mind his journalism but, or his novels, but any of his essays, any other piece of writing he had ever put out there. And do you think do you think that political commentary more broadly, of course, it's sort of acceptable with broadsheets and reporting, but it has to be in, written in quite a dry, factual way. But do you think that commentary and journalism in that realm would be better served if people took greater inspiration from the Wolfs and Buckleys and George Wills of the world? Yeah, I don't think reporting has to be boring. Um, yeah, I mean, reporting you, I mean, I, and I think the best work I do are the, the reported pieces, not the kind of daily columns that I write, um, reporting work, you know, and Tom Wolf was a, was a, was a first rate reporter. Um, Hunter Thompson was a pretty good reporter, except he made stuff up from time to time too, which is, <laughs> is kind of a problem for you as a reporter. Um, it's unfortunate. Um. You know, Hunter Thompson, if you've ever read his uh, Hell's Angels, just a wonderful, wonderful piece of writing. And he was a victim of his own success in a sense in that he spent much of his life after Hell's Angels kind of playing the character Hunter Thompson rather than going out and doing the sort of work he'd done in, in Hell's Angels. Uh, Tom Wolfe um, managed to avoid that, I think. He never played a character, although he wore a costume, that kind of you know, white suit and uh, all that business. Um... I think writing would be better if there were better writing. Yeah, I think people would pay more journalism <laughs> if it were uh, more interesting. You know, I could, I think most days I could sit down and I could write the two left columns of the New York Times opinion page, you know, the editorials, and um, and pretty well write what they're going to write because they're predictable. Um, you can turn on any of the major cable news shows and you will hear the same predictable things said in the same predictable way by the same predictable people, um, mostly wearing the same clothes and uh, getting their hair done by the same people, much less of a concern for me, I suppose. And, um, you know, it's just excruciating. Um, I've never actually watched a Fox News program all the way through, and I used to be on Fox News a lot. <laughs> um, I mean, the only Fox News programs I've ever seen all the way through are a few episodes of Red Eye that I was on all the way through. Um, I just I can't do that stuff. I'll watch television news when there is a live event that's dramatic and, and when television really does its thing. You know, when you get a 9-11 uh, or the Berlin Wall coming down or a war or something like that, then uh, television is really invaluable just to stick a camera there and, you know, kind of let you see what's going on. But in terms of watching, you know, four I want to call them dolts, but the truth is they're not dolts. They're not dumb people. Um, they're just, they figured out that the way to build and keep an audience and to make money and enjoy influence in cable news is by being this kind of predictable talking points, repeating team player, this, you know, Sean Hannity style cheerleader. And uh, I've never wanted to be that or to do that. So um, I don't, uh, I don't watch a lot of that. And I don't do a lot of it anymore. Um, Partly that's a, a function of me no longer living in New York. So when you're not in New York City, um, you don't do as, do as much television. You know, people don't know how this stuff works, by the way, which is unless you're someone who is a contractor, you know, an employee of Fox News or CNN or something like that, you're just a guy who works at a magazine that they call 20 minutes before the show starts and says, hey, <laughs> can you come and sit in on this thing? And um, I mean, sometimes it's about something you actually know something about or about an article you've written. But often it's, you know, it's just... You're a person, you write about the news. We think maybe you can speak English and we're going to talk about today's news. <laughs> I remember uh, I've told this story a number of times before. I got a call uh, from this desperate producer saying, hey, we really need a Russia expert today. We had this guy booked and he got canceled at the last minute. We don't know what the problem is, but we've got this Russia panel going on and we really need someone who really knows Russia to come and talk. Can you be there in 20 minutes? We'll send a car for you and you know, get on over here. And I was like, I could do it, but... I don't know anything about Russia. I mean, I could, I can find it on a map. I can tell you <laughs> about Russian politics or Russian history as any other average American probably could. Um, they don't know. They don't care. It doesn't really matter very much. Uh, so that kind of stuff is really tiresome. 
Um, honestly, I don't read a lot of political writing and commentary. I don't watch a lot of it. I mean, I read the New York Times every day. I read the Wall Street Journal every day. I read National Review. I read some other uh, sources. But, um, you know, I don't dig through a lot of political books. I'm not out there reading um, every op-ed and every newspaper and every syndicated columnist and all that stuff. I don't think it really adds much to my uh, to my own work. And it's um, unpleasant and tedious. Well, the smallest minority is certainly written in a colorful, vivid way, to say the least. Um, it is the, easily the most profane book Ragnar has ever published. <laughs> you, know, you certainly don't see much of that in most political writing. No. And the really the uh, most abrasive parts got cut. There were two sections that got cut that I really liked, um, which I'll find an excuse to recycle somewhere else uh, at some point. But um, yeah, it's um, it's a little bit of a screed. It's, um, for those of you who haven't read the book, there's a lot of footnotes in it. And the main body of the book is kind of, I mean, not a typical conventional political book, but it's an argument about how social media and the team sports aspect of politics is really warping our political discourse and limiting our ability to engage productively uh, with one another in, in, um, in a representative democracy. And then the footnotes, which I guess you're maybe a fourth of the book, are kind of me annotating what I'm actually thinking as I write this stuff. And that's the part that's you know pretty profane and I hope funny and, uh, and uh, amusing. Well, if we unpack your objections to Twitter, and I say this, I... <laughs> despise it as much as you do, but I say this fully aware of the irony that we will be having to share this on Twitter to promote it. So what are your principal objections to Twitter, for those who may be aware? And since you view it quite openly as a cesspool, why do you think it is the case? What is it in people that makes it so, that makes you want to give up on mankind often by reading various threads on there? Well, there are two kinds of people who use Twitter. Um, the bigger group of people who use Twitter are dim nobodies who want to scream at each other. <laughs> um, and then you've got other people who use Twitter who are generally media, political, cultural types who are in occupations that they have entered because they like for people to pay attention to. And uh, Twitter gets you those little jolts of attention. So you don't have to spend a year writing a book and publishing it. You can, you know, boom, little jolt, boom, little jolt, boom, little jolt. And um, there was a woman I remember hearing on the radio who was uh, an actual rock star um, from a very famous band. And she was talking about how sad she felt on Twitter, you know, setting up this little stage for herself and then climbing up on it and saying, please pay attention to me. And, um, you know, she's an actual rock star with a real stage that she can get on. Uh, for other sorts of people, I think that it's, um, you know, much more alluring that way. It is, the thing about Twitter is it's not a real conversation and they aren't real relationships. They are uh, facsimiles of those things. And um, what people do on Twitter is not about exchanging uh, views or ideas or opinions or perspectives. It's a kind of uh, ritual in which, you know, attention is exchanged in various sorts of ways. And people go to it for um, you know, the psychological dividend more than they do to learn things. I mean, I guess it's a pretty good news aggregator for some people. And it may be useful marketing-wise for some people, although I found in my case that it really wasn't, um, which is one of the reasons I stopped using it. It just wasn't a very good use of time. And it's generally, you know, ends up being me at 2 o'clock in the morning, beating up some undergraduate at Lehigh University, <laughs> um, you know, who doesn't uh, know where the world is. And um, so, yeah, Twitter tends to bring out the worst in people um, because it is immediate, because it's short, because it's so you know, tribalistic and team sporty and all the rest of it. And I think that people would be better off. Um, you know, there's a, there's a sort of a Zen joke about, um, you know, sitting in traffic and to remember that, you are not in traffic, you are traffic. And uh, I think of Twitter the same way, you know, you're not in sewage, you, uh, you are the sewage. <laughs> and then I, the same was true for me and anyone else. It's, you know, not a, not a holier than thou thing. 
But um, and also it's a terribly easy way to procrastinate if you're a writer. And uh, because it kind of sort of feels like work and because some people are asked to use social media as part of their professional um, responsibilities, you can kind of call it work sometimes. And um, so I think it's seductive for those reasons, but I think it's not very useful. Uh, mostly, you know, I read novels and stuff. Do you object to other social media applications for much the same reasons, or do you think that they are slightly less obnoxious because they you have a uh, like Facebook, for instance, because they are arranged in a different format to Twitter, or are they just as generally poisonous? They're pretty much all garbage. Um, I mean, I don't have experience with all of them, so I don't know. Um, I know some people who um, apparently get very good use out of Instagram. Um, and maybe these things are better and easier when you are away from the uh, political world. Although, unfortunately, the political world tends to colonize other aspects of culture. So, um, you know, I can't necessarily speak to all these things. The ones I've used, uh, Facebook and Twitter, are just, yeah, irredeemable, I think. You say in the book, in one of the many colorful turns of phrase, but we're going down the road to smurf them, uh, becoming a, a lot of the tiny, homogenous people, tiny both in stature and in mentally too. Yeah. Um, and of course, you, we hope that individualism can be revived. But are you optimistic in that regard when so many people seem drawn toward the collective and the mob mentality that permeates Twitter? Well, you know, Twitter is a pretty narrow slice of life still. I think that's worth keeping in mind that um, real life is becoming more like Twitter, but Twitter is still not real life. Um, you know, the United States is a weird place in that um, Americans are idiots when you look at them as voters and as um, participants in a, in a representative democracy. It's a miracle that we survived as long as we have. <laughs> um, but in everything else, they're pretty solid. You know, um, they're a brilliant, innovative, creative, generous, decent, uh, funny people um, who do a lot of cool and interesting things. And a lot of what everyone loves about the modern world uh, comes from garages in California and uh, places like that. So I can be pretty down on the United States culturally because I mostly interact with American popular culture through through politics or through things tangential to it, through news media. And that all is, of course, a, a great big, deep sewer. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff going on out there as well, too. So um, I tend to, to tend to be mixed. I'm very pessimistic about some aspects of American life and pretty optimistic about other aspects of American life. I often say I'm a short term pessimist and a long term optimist. I think that our um, our current political problems in this, you know, increasingly quasi sacramental attitude we have toward politics and especially the presidency is going to be a problem. The uh, unsustainable fiscal situation we have is going to also be a problem. And those problems are going to make one another worse. So we're in for some difficulty in the short term, I think, almost certainly. But um in the long term, I think the country's going to be fine because Americans are smart. They've got a lot of capital. They've got a lot of resources. They don't want to be poor. They don't want to be miserable. They don't want to be vulnerable. And they know how to ensure that that doesn't happen. So I kind of think that's where we are. Are there any, if we can unpack and diverge and unpack that briefly, in the long term, are hmm. there any fundamental perhaps aspects of government and the American political life that are deeply concerning to you? Sure. I mean, we have um, a well a turn toward illiberalism and uh, autocracy right now. It's on both sides of the political aisles in both parties. It's uh, at all levels of society. Um, we are the spoiled children of history. Um, what the world calls liberalism or capitalism has done more for us than it has for any other people in the world. And we are deeply unhappy about it. I get into this in the book a lot that um Often there are changes socially and economically that leave people far, far better off in material terms 
and not just in terms of, you know, how many calories do I get to eat in square feet in my house and that kind of stuff, but in what kind of experiences I get to have, what sort of choices I have in life, whether I can travel, whether I get to choose my own occupation. And people end up better off on all of those fronts, but these same changes make them unhappy because they upend previously existing social arrangement and social hierarchies. Um, Eric Fromm wrote a lot about this in the context of the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of what we would call capitalism um, or, or, or liberalism. And these changes that gave European serfs um, the ability to live better than they had, to choose their own occupations, to start to have political rights and economic rights and real freedom and real um, prosperity were deeply, deeply unpopular because they left people deracinated. They left old existing status hierarchies up for renegotiation. And um, this caused a great deal of anxiety. And that anxiety expressed itself in various kinds of religious fanaticism, the beginnings of what we now call nationalism. Uh, the Reformation, in many ways, was a, was a result of that. So um, what we're going through right now with what we call, for lack of a better term, globalization, is not as radical a change as that was, obviously. But um, it brings with it similar changes. We have um, certain kinds of economic and social challenges that we didn't have 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, we have more choices, but we also have more competitors. And for some people, you know, and again, this is a very much a class thing for people like me, that is uh, great because it creates all sorts of opportunities and wonderful things we get to do and new resources we get to tap. For people who are less inclined to take risks, who are less uh, well suited to compete in that globalized economic environment, who want to stay in the town they grew up in, who want to be uh, attached in a very strong way to a particular place and particular communities, and uh, and find it more difficult to do so in uh, a globalized modern economy, but they experience these uh, new opportunities as burdens rather than as blessings. And that is a lot of what's causing this moment of uh, anxiety and bitterness that we have right now. It's that these old hierarchies are up for renegotiation and people are very anxious about where they're going to come out. I've uh, put this question to a few different uh, conservatives, particularly over the last year, and some of them, in speaking particularly of that, uh, the atomization in, that has partly resulted from globalization and so on that you just discussed there, some of them are attributing the uh, sort of malaise, the growing malaise that we are witnessing to a certain extent, a certain extent in society, of rising suicide rates, rates of mental illness, and so on, to a decline in religiosity. Do you think there is any fundamental truth to that, or is it more in the, as you said, the reordering of hierarchies and changes that we are undergoing institutionally in a broader sense? Yeah, I think it's. Um... People make choices because they want certain things in life, and then they resent the fact that they had to make the choice, and the choice came with a trade-off. So if you look, um, you know, arguably the most radical change in economic and social arrangements in human history is something that happened at different times in different societies, where you move from having a workforce that is almost exclusively agricultural and fixed in place to one in which people have a variety of different kinds of jobs. Um, they may live in cities, they may live in the countryside, they may move cities. And one of the few nearly universal laws of human life and human conduct is that given a choice between subsistence farming and almost anything else, people will choose almost anything else. Because <laughs> it's a really, really hard way to make a living. And it's insecure and there's famine and things like that. And you don't live very long and it's miserable and you have to work. Really, really hard. So um, given a choice, people will leave those occupations and do other things. And we've also seen that um, in the more modern uh, economic context. So there are people you could, you know, I could stay, I could still be in my hometown of Lubbock, Texas. I could work at the newspaper there. I could make a perfectly <coughs> adequate living, I suppose, there. Um, but if you want... Uh, something else, and sometimes it requires making choices, and often that choice means moving to a different place. Uh, we have seen a lot of geographic sorting of um, people who 
are seeing that there are great concentrations of employment opportunities and educational opportunities, capital, and other things in a relatively small number of cities and um, you know urban metros. And so there's been a great deal of sorting having to do with that that I think causes some anxiety to people because I imagine there are people who who would like to um, you know be in finance or advertising or media or technology who don't want to move to one of the places that are centers of those businesses because they feel culturally alien there. And um, at that point, you just kind of want to tell them to grow up, you know, <laughs> because life, life, is, life is full of trade-offs and you don't always get to do everything exactly the way you want. I mean, I probably am the last person to complain about that because I do more or less get to do things the way I want to, at least I do right now. And... Um, but yeah, we have we have these tremendous opportunities, but all opportunities come with obligations and trade-offs. And um, I think there's a certain kind of immaturity that causes us to resent those. And so rather than deal with the trade-off, we complain about the fact that it exists. If we can shift back to the book, mm -hmm. uh, the smallest minority itself is a term that you say at the beginning you wish to reclaim from Ayn Rand. And what in <laughs> what, in your view, I'm curious, really defines an individual, especially in present times? Are there any obvious qualities? Well, I think, I mean, in terms of politics and media, which is really what this is about, but also in terms of citizenship, it means the ability to distinguish between yourself as an individual mind with thoughts and ideas of its own and a member of a team. And um, and then also to understand that other people are just like you, that they are more than being a member of a team. And uh, if we can only interact with one another as mascots and totems and symbols of rival cultural groups, then we can never have a real exchange or a real conversation. And unfortunately for us, that's how democracies get things done, is we essentially talk through our problems. And if we can't talk through them, then we can't really uh, do anything to address them, which is why in the United States, we've got this weird thing right now where things that used to be thought of as natural virtues of a mature republic, like bipartisanship, compromise, uh, consensus, those sorts of things are held in contempt and suspicion. And instead, it's, you know, are you pure enough? Are you a member of our team exactly? Did you ever once have lunch with someone from the other side? And that kind of thing. Like every now and then I'll like I'll write a piece for the Washington Post and I'll get people who will say, why would you want to be in that newspaper? And I'm, well, a lot of people read it. Well, yeah, but they're all you know, a bunch of evil liberals. Well, I want to convince them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I used to be on MSNBC from time to time and that sort of thing. And people would really, uh, you know, uh, freak out. So there's this idea that we should um, be first and foremost loyal members of our team and our tribe and uh, nothing else. And that is really what I'm getting about in, uh, in the smallest minority. And it makes you stupid and it makes you boring, so don't do it. Do you think this is a particularly difficult time to be an individual? Or is it actually quite an easier time in some ways because of the atomization that we touched upon and the wave of new media that it has, it has engendered. Now we have blogging platforms, we have all sorts of independent media networks where people can express themselves and of their own accord produce intelligent content if they so want to. Is it, yeah, yes, ultimately is this, is this quite a difficult time to be an individual or less so than some may expect? I think in many ways, it's easier because there are more ways to support yourself economically. Uh, there are more ways to um, organize and conduct your life. If you look at things like music, movies, and television shows, they're a lot better now than they were, say, in the 1980s when I was growing up. Uh, you've got a lot more choices. And the reason we have a lot more choices is because there are many, many models for being able to be successful, say, as a musician. Um, you know, the 1980s arena rock star, uh, the, you know, kind of a Bruce Springsteen model of being a popular musician is no longer the only one. You can be a band that's got 50,000 very, very dedicated followers, but they buy everything that you put out and you can make a perfectly you know, reasonable living doing that. 
you can be a writer like me that you know most people have never heard of and most people probably never will hear of um but who has an audience and an audience that is large enough and engaged enough to make it economically viable to uh, continue to do what i do so uh, one thing i got into in the book is that um you know we we hear about these you know twitter outrage mob phenomenons and cancellations and all that stuff and those stories almost always are focused on people like me, uh, people who are in media. So, you know, I get fired by The Atlantic, or Ann Coulter gets a speech canceled somewhere, or Milo Yiannopoulos can't do whatever it is Milo tries to do. And, um, you know, and that's what the story is about. But, of course, it's really pretty easy for people like us. We're in the controversy business, and uh, so controversy more or less helps us. You know, I probably made more money the year I got fired by The Atlantic than I would have made working for The Atlantic. Um, because suddenly people are talking about you and there's a market for your stuff. It's much, much more difficult for people who are in other kinds of occupations and who are socially and economically more vulnerable. So, you know, it's not so much about people like me, but someone who is a uh, you know, manager of a Starbucks in Philadelphia who ends up in the middle of some Twitter storm for simply trying to do his or her job. And um, that has real consequences for someone like that. But this, you know, team aspect way of looking at these things can only conceive of that person as a, a scapegoat and as a representative of what's evil and wrong in the world, uh, rather than a human being who uh, has a difficult job and trying to do it well. Is the mob, mob culture is distressingly nothing new in, I would say, American politics, the politics everywhere, really. But yeah. is... Is the mob more dangerous now because it can take the, the Starbucks example is a great one, wherein you can quite literally take someone completely unassuming who's just trying to make an honest living and plaster them all over the Internet, all over social media and potentially cripple their livelihoods yeah. in, because of the situation that we are now in. Have things become more dangerous? And is that in part what inspired you to write the book when you did? Well, they've certainly become more dangerous from the point of view of employment. So, um, you know, one of the chapters of the book and one of the themes of the book deals with this emerging thing of uh, using employment as a tool and weapon of social and political discipline. To say that if you are a political nonconformist of some kind, not only can you not get elected to office, you can't manage Starbucks, you can't work at Mojo Burrito. You can't uh, <laughs> you know, do this or that, or in, you know, in my case, be a writer for this magazine, but not that magazine. And um, so the weaponization of employment, I think, is a really interesting phenomenon of our time. And it's something that Hayek uh, actually wrote about. He worried about the uh, you know, emergence of corporate employment in big organizations as a kind of social norm that this would inculcate kind of organization man habits in people. And he thought you needed a few people who were economically independent, uh, who couldn't be pressured and bullied and that sort of thing. So we do get more of those people, I suppose, in some ways, because you don't really have to be exactly independently wealthy to be immune from those uh, mob attacks. You just have to have an audience that's economically viable. But um, again, for people who are not professionally engaged in writing and controversies and advocacy, it really is... Um, I think a dangerous time from, from, from that point of view. And losing a job, being unemployed, being uh, you know, unable to sustain yourself economically is very, very painful and disruptive and traumatic thing. Um, you know, the one period in my life where I had a modest spell of uh, unemployment after that newspaper failure was probably the most difficult time in my life. And my prospects were still pretty good. Um, you know, getting fired from uh, Starbucks for political nonconformity um, it's got to be a very, very intense and disruptive and uh, difficult thing to, um, to deal with. Two interrelated questions I'd like to end on. We discussed some of your uh, journalistic influences earlier. What are some of your favorite books and what books have had a particular influence both on your uh, philosophical worldview but also just in general, what are some of your favorite pieces of literature or 
favorite works of political theory and so on? You know, I um, when I was still quite young, I was maybe uh, 13 or 14, I picked up a copy of uh, Tom Wolfe's uh, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test at a garage sale. I think I paid 25 cents for it, something like that. And that book was a real eye, eye opener. That was a life changing book. Um, not so much for the subject matter because hippies and drugs, who cares? But, uh, <laughs> but just for the way it was written, for it being this uh, very literary treatment of a nonfiction story and a nonfiction account. And that really um, opened my eyes to a particular kind of writing that I hadn't really been too familiar with before that. And uh, it was something that I actively wanted to uh, pursue from then on. I mentioned Hunter Thompson's Hell's Angels before, which is a similar thing for me, although I didn't come to that until later in life. Um, in terms of works of fiction, uh, Thackeray's Vanity Fair has been uh, very important in how I think about the world. Uh, I've been reading a uh, Balzac book lately. It's pretty good. Um, Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace is one of my favorite novels. Um, again, similar to Tom Wolfe for me in that it um, was eye-opening about just the possibilities of language and prose. Uh, I spent a lot of time studying early modern poetry, you know, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Wallace Stevens, those guys. And um, there's a certain kind of writing that, uh, and a certain kind of way of doing things in poetry that I think you can extract from that and use outside of the context of writing verse, which uh, you're all welcome. I don't really do very much of, at least for publication. <laughs> and um, yeah, a number of things like that. What should we be reading right now during this period of isolation? Or what should we be watching? What should we be listening to? Are there any exciting magazines for the flourishing? Are there any exciting books for the current that you have enjoyed of late that have newly been published? How can we make the quarantine slightly easier on ourselves? Well, there's this one magazine that started in 1955. I think that uh, you should all be subscribing to. It's called National <laughs> Review. And we could really use about another million subscribers. So I would uh, appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I set you up for that perfectly, didn't I? Yeah, you did. So, <laughs> I always tell people to read Moby Dick if they haven't read Moby Dick. It's a great book, one that actually really deserves its reputation, but that people tend not to finish. Um, within the last couple of years, I finally got around to reading Middlemarch, which I'd never read before, and it may be the best novel I've ever read, so I definitely recommend that to people. Um, in terms of film and stuff, I was actually having a little argument with my colleague Kyle Smith about this, that... Um, I really like The Seventh Seal and Plague movies. If you're looking for plague movies to watch during the plague, that's probably a pretty good one. I'm a big fan of No Country for Old Men, both the novel and the uh, Coen Brothers movie, which I think is a masterpiece, and I've probably watched 60 or 70 times. Uh, I'm not sure my wife uh, appreciates that. <laughs> uh, um, she just kind of rolls her eyes and walks past. And that's what she doesn't roll her eyes. I should take that back. She's, um, she's not that kind. Um... There's also another uh, Cormac McCarthy uh, novel called Outer Dark, which I think is great, but don't read it if you are queasy. It's one of the few books I've ever had to actually just put down because it's so disturbing. And uh, but also a good book for maybe these kinds of uh, plagueish times. I'm sure just about every Cormac McCarthy book, at least based on the ones that I've read is certainly appropriate for co present times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I shudder to think, have you read um, Child of God? No. It's uh, another particularly gruesome book. I haven't read Out of Dark myself. I've always meant to, but I wonder if it's, I wonder if they're equally grotesque. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't read it, but um, I would, I would find it hard to believe that it was more grotesque than, than Outer Dark, but who knows? He's a great writer, so he's capable of anything, I suppose. Well, this has been wonderful, Kevin. Thank you very much for indulging me. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to another of our In Conversation web series, and of course, thanks to Kevin Williamson and Guy Denton. See you again soon.